Our knowledge of the Egyptians and most of the artworks we have retrieved from their civilization we owe to the Egyptian preoccupation with life after death. The concern of every Egyptian king or noble as soon as he came to power or accumulated enough wealth was to begin his preparation for the afterlife. The building of temples recorded the ruler's deeds and piety, but building his tomb assured him everlasting life. We'll look at these tombs, the mysterious and beautifully decorated Homes for Eternity, in this lecture. A significant portion of the workforce and the Egyptian economy was driven by the building and provisioning of tombs. Stone cutters, gold workers and traders, teams of sculptors, tomb painters, furniture makers, craftsmen of all sorts were dedicated to this end. The richer or more powerful the person, the greater the tomb and its contents, which were meant to ease the deceased into the afterlife and to provide every convenience and beautiful object one might require in the afterworld. Tutankhamun's tomb, as rich and beautiful as it was, did not exemplify the tombs of the pharaohs. The Valley of the Kings and the Valley of the Queens west of Thebes were once chock full of richly appointed eternal homes for the royals. Their contents must have been stupendous. Tutankhamun was only a minor boy king who had hurriedly been buried in a tomb that could not have been intended for a royal. Looters cleaned out almost all of the other tombs eons ago, but the tomb decoration was far more elaborate and beautiful than the minor boy king's tomb. So, what did a real royal tomb of a major figure in Egyptian history look like? Something like this. Here, you are looking at the tomb of Queen Nefertari, the great wife of Ramses II, Ramses the Great, of the 19th dynasty, the New Kingdom, about 1250 BC. She is not to be confused with Nefertiti, wife of King Akhenaten in the previous dynasty. Nefertari's tomb, which we see here, is a masterpiece of painting. You'll see stunning images from this elaborately decorated tomb that had lain hidden for over 3,000 years. They were not meant to be seen by living human eyes ever again. As you may recall from our earlier lecture, the Old Kingdom of Egypt was the age of the pyramids. These structures were strictly funerary. They contained the tomb of the king deep within and were dedicated to his resurrection as a god in the next life. The attached mortuary temples, complexes, and cities of the dead consisted of burials of wives, relatives, and high officials of the king. These created a grand compound, as you can see here, on the edge of the desert of the Giza Plateau. The Old Kingdom pyramids were by no means the only pyramids built in Egypt. They were merely the largest. Pyramids continued to be built for hundreds of years into the Middle Kingdom and on, but they were small. By the time of the founding of the New Kingdom, the practice of burial in a pyramid was abandoned. Religious customs, beliefs changed, for one thing. For another, it had become increasingly clear that marking the spot of a king's burial so magnificently was not always such a great idea. It obviously marked it for robbery as well. The king's body needed to be secure to guarantee his resurrection. The New Kingdom in Egypt began with the expulsion of a foreign people called the Hyksos, along with the ascension of King Ahmos. Ahmos began the 18th dynasty in 1550 BC. It was a new age, the grandest for Egypt. This era was the time of the greatest might and expansion of the Egyptian empire. The Egyptian capital was firmly established at Thebes, 
in Upper Egypt, a remote area of the western desert where Ra, the sun god, set and began his solemn journey through the underworld was selected as the burial area for royalty. This was considered the realm of Osiris, lord of the underworld, and Anubis, the jackal god of embalming. Tombs for the kings were first carved high into the rock walls of the cliff formed by the course of an ancient river. They later spread to lower areas. The tombs became more complex with time. Plans were carefully drawn and executed by master architects and craftsmen. Each of the different rooms of a tomb was painstakingly decorated according to religious formulas. On the whole, they were devoted to the journey and arrival of the deceased into the afterlife, where immortality was achieved. Passages from magical texts, such as the Book of the Dead, were written on the walls and copiously illustrated. The religious concerns of this time changed significantly from the Old Kingdom and the pyramids when the burial chambers of kings had been unadorned. In the non-royal tombs of the Old Kingdom, decoration of walls in relief and painting was rife. It was meant to perpetuate the owner's existence in the afterlife by providing the offerings of food, drink, and so forth, everything that they would need in the afterlife. The inscriptions said things like a thousand of bread, a thousand of beer, and seemed to literally provide sustenance for the deceased. Some of these tomb paintings are delightful. They give us keen insight into aspects of Egyptian life, like farming or butchering, hunting, and leisure activities. But these scenes were all meant to function as a sort of insurance for continued sustenance and offerings in the afterlife. It was charmingly literal, maybe a little naive. In contrast, by the time of the New Kingdom, 1550 to 1070 BC, and especially in the 19th dynasty, the royal tomb decoration was devoted to a serious religious event, the meeting with various gods especially with Osiris and Anubis, who equip the deceased for the perilous journey to the afterlife. While there were conventions in painting and decoration, there was also great innovation and sophistication in many of the tomb decorations. In fact, Theban tomb painting is one of the greatest genres of painting ever created, in my opinion. I was so fascinated that I even wrote my undergraduate thesis on this subject. The point that it was all devoted to a religious cult of the dead, never meant to be seen again after its creation, makes it all the more remarkable. Let's take a look into these hidden secret tombs. Here lies the Valley of the Kings. Over it, a mountain, El Kurn, looms, and it is in the shape of a pyramid. The mountain casts its magic symbolic power over all the tombs in the valley. Not far away lies the Valley of the Queens. Nobles had their tombs as well, and generations of skilled workmen lived in a nearby village called Deir el Medina. This remote outpost to the west of the Nile could be guarded and defended against tomb robbers, it was thought. Unfortunately, they were wrong about that because many of the people that dug the tombs went back later to rob them. A king's body was buried in his tomb here in the valley, but his mortuary cult, where the religious rites were enacted, was located closer to the Nile. Seti I, the father of Ramses the Great and father-in-law of Nefertari, who ruled 1306 to 1290 BC, had the most complete and elaborate tomb in the valley. Seti's tomb is one of the grandest, most complex versions of a royal tomb. Here are the essential elements of royal tombs of this era. 
a shaft or stairway down into the rock, a descending corridor that might have rooms on either side of it, an antechamber, and then the final burial chamber in which the king's sarcophagus would be placed. Making the tomb required men to laboriously excavate the limestone while others removed the stone chips. Plasters had to begin on a room as soon as the excavators finished and moved on to the next. Then draftsmen sketched out the scenes to be painted and the hieroglyphic passages to be written. Then relief carvers in stone moved in, some to remove the background areas while the master carvers shaped the surfaces of the figures and scenes. At the very end, the painters came to apply the colors. They might all be working at once on different parts of the tomb to complete it under time pressures. Seti's tomb has magnificent paintings of the stars and constellations in the burial chamber. Elsewhere, Seti's tomb contains depictions of passages from the Book of Amduat, the Book of Gates, the Litany of Re, in the descending passages and rooms. These were all underworld books, essentially magic spells, that helped him survive the dangerous journey towards his resurrection and eternal life. Seti I's tomb was opened in 1817 by the infamous Italian Giovanni Belzoni, or the Great Belzoni, its so-called excavator. Unfortunately, it has deteriorated considerably since that time thanks to the exposure, and it's hardly the glory it once was. Similarly, the wife of Seti's son, Ramses, Queen Nefertari, had her extraordinary tomb opened in 1904. It began to suffer the effects of tourism and open air. The humidity level in the tomb fluctuated to its detriment. People brushed against the walls, erasing the colors, and petty vandalism took its toll. Salts also rose to the surface of the paintings and began to pull them apart. The tomb of Queen Tef Nefertari has been closed and reopened intermittently. In the 1980s and 1990s, it was extensively conserved by a project of the Getty Conservation Institute with the Egyptian Antiquities Organization. Here, the conservators are removing salts and stabilizing the paintings, preserving them, one hopes, for many generations to come. But who was Nefertari exactly, and why did she have such a grand tomb? Nefertari was an unusual queen, the principal wife and great favorite of King Ramses II. Ramses the Great, of course, was one of the most famous, powerful kings to rule Egypt. Nefertari may have married him when she was just 13. Nefertari was not Ramses' only wife, but she was his first and favorite one. Both king and queen were immortalized on many monuments above ground. These monuments included the temples at Karnak, at Luxor, and most famously, the temple of Abu Simbel at Aswan. This last was a colossal temple in remote Nubia. Ramses II built it to impress the Nubians with his power and control after his victory at the Battle of Kadesh. The temple of Abu Simbel was threatened by the waters of the Aswan Dam, so it was laboriously removed block by block and relocated to a new resting place in 1968. It's become a major tourist attraction in Egypt because of its monumental scale and its awe-inspiring sculptures. You can see the images of Nefertari here on the main facade. Nefertari had her own temple, too, the Queen's Temple at Abu Simbel, where she is, in a very unusual step, shown at the same colossal scale as her husband. Ramses dedicated the temple to her like this. Ramses, too, has made a temple 
excavated in the mountain of eternal workmanship in Nubia for the king's great wife, Nefertari, beloved of Mut, forever and ever, for whom the sun does shine. Isn't that more romantic than a diamond ring? Nefertari was clearly one of the most loved and celebrated women in the history of Egypt. She wielded influence like her forebears, Queen Nefertiti and Hatshepsut, who took on the role of king early in the 18th dynasty. Nefertari was even given the title Mistress of Upper and Lower Egypt, a form of title which was usually just the king's. Though she bore Ramses the Great six children or so, none survived him to inherit the throne after his 67-year reign. Ramses had eight wives that we know of and over a hundred children, but Nefertari was the most beloved. She came from a powerful Theban family, so the marriage was a politically clever move since it gave Ramses relatives and power in Upper Egypt. What did Nefertari's tomb depict? Not one thing concerning her earthly life, her cares, her worries, or her accomplishments. Rather, it was solely concerned with her transition into the next life. It was her house of eternity. The tortuous path she needed to take to get there was outlined and magically assisted by the decorations on its walls. You enter the tomb and begin your journey to the afterlife by descending the stairs into the first chamber. Though this is very badly damaged now, you would see a large image of the sun disk adorning the upper lintel ceiling, or soffit, as you enter. This begins the transit of the sun. It sails on a solar bark through the sky, setting into the underworld, only to be born again. Two birds, the forms of goddesses Isis and Nephthys, flank the solar disk in brilliant yellow. The sun and Nefertari descend into the tomb and the underworld. The tomb continues its descent with a second stairway. As you descend into the antechamber, you'd be struck by the ceilings decorated in a gorgeous pattern of brilliant blue shimmering with yellow stars, the heavens. This chamber is quite damaged, but it illustrates passages from the Book of the Dead. We can see in the upper register of the wall that Nefertari herself is seated playing Senet, a traditional Egyptian game. Her white gown isn't quite closed, and a continuous strip of her naked body is visible. Her spirit, shown as a ba bird with a human head, is to the right. Her kneeling figure, her ka, or life force, adores the god Atum on the next wall. Continuing to the center, though damaged, we can still see Nefertari's mummified body lying between goddesses Nephthys and Isis in bird form. They are protecting her. A Benu bird, a beautiful blue heron, is associated with resurrection. Notice that to the left are the remnants of two lions guarding Acher. Acher, the god guarding the eastern and western horizons, is shown as a sun disk. This function of the lions is consistent with the same guarding role and solar associations we saw in Mesopotamia and earlier in Egypt. The text illustrated here is from chapter 17 of the Book of the Dead, which was an ancient Egyptian funerary text of the New Kingdom, inscribed on the tomb walls. It begins, beginning of the praises and recitations to come forth and go down into the necropolis to be transfigured in the beautiful west, the coming forth by day in order to assume any form he wishes, playing senate, coming forth as a living Ba by the Osiris, the king's great wife, mistress of the two lands, Nefertari, beloved of Mut. 
There are also mummified images of Horus and the gods of the canopic jars, which hold Nefertari's precious viscera after mummification. This upper section of the tomb, then, is devoted to the preservation of her body and meeting with the deities who assure her place in the netherworld. If we continue to the east wall and the side chamber, we have Nefertari entering the underworld, being greeted by Osiris and Anubis. Osiris is depicted on the left with his characteristic white mummiform shape. He holds crook and flail as he welcomes Nefertari to his realm, the underworld. He tells Nefertari, I give you eternity like Ra, my father. He's got green flesh, symbolic of vegetation and thus renewal, and he's enclosed in his shrine with striped poles. Anubis is on the right in his own shrine in the form of a jackal-headed man. Both are depicted on a brilliant yellow background, while the rest of the tomb is painted in white, creating a gorgeous contrast and perhaps mimicking the sun's light. In the center, above the doorway, you can see an elaborate decoration consisting of 11 uraei, cobras poised to strike, each separated by blue ostrich feathers, with a god's figure seated in the center. Other goddesses lead Nefertari confidently into her afterlife on the entrance walls. Selket, the scorpion goddess, with a scorpion on her head. We saw her in Tut's tomb as well, and Neith. They wear these elaborate, beautiful red bead net dresses which expose their breasts. They're elegant in form. Their bodies are painted the yellow of the background for the gods' shrines. Both goddesses welcome Nefertari with similar texts consisting of titles and so forth. Following eastward, we see a wonderful depiction of Nefertari being led by Isis to the seated, scarab-headed god Kepri on the northeast wall. Here we see Nefertari in a typical representation for her tomb. She wears a diaphanous flowing white gown, exquisitely translucent, elegantly pleated with wide sleeves. It's tied high above the waist with a long red sash. Nefertari wears a dark wig with three sections, surmounted by a gold neck bet vulture crown with two golden feathers. She wears a gold and colored stone broad collar and is barefoot like the goddess Isis in front. Her figure is youthfully slim and long-limbed, shown in classic Egyptian fashion, chest frontal, legs in profile, head in profile with a large frontal eye. She is strikingly beautiful with her long almond eyes and delicate lips. The queen's flesh is redder than Isis, who's yellow and wears a gorgeous multicolored garment that is predominantly red. She holds Nefertari's hand in hers. Their long fingers droop languidly. Isis wears horns with a sun disk and holds a wasp scepter, a symbol of power, with her other hand. These ladies are so slender and lovingly carved that there's hardly any equal. Let's look at Kepri. He's a scarab-headed god, seated on a throne which bears the very ancient Sematawi symbol on its side, like Khafre's in the Old Kingdom. The scarab beetle was a symbol of the sun and rebirth. Why? Because it put its eggs in a ball of dung, which it then rolls across the ground, just like the sun rising and being pushed across the sky. He holds an Ankh symbol and a was scepter. Both Kepri and Isis welcome Nefertari. They tell her that they have made a place for her in the necropolis. On the opposite wall, the southeast, we see the queen being led by Horus, son of Isis. They are approaching Reharakti and Hathor, 
who are seated along the corner. The queen wears the same garment and accessories. Horus has the head of a falcon and wears a composite crown of Upper and Lower Egypt. Hathor is wearing her name emblem on her head, and both she and Re Harakti are seated on elaborate stools with the Sematawi symbol. The hawk god wears a solar disk with the uraeus. Above the doorway, we have a spread-winged vulture, the goddess Nekbet, who grasps the Shen sign for eternity in its talons. As you enter the annex, she confronts Thoth, the ibis-headed god of scribes. The queen receives a writing pallet and water bowl from Thoth, a magical object, a frog, is also shown. Inscribed here is a quote from the Book of the Dead. Bring me the water, the bowl, the pallet, and the writing case of Thoth, and the secrets within them. The scenes on the east wall show Nefertari with sumptuous piles of offerings to the gods Osiris and Atum, the creator god, both of whom are seated. There are many sorts of food. At the bottom, you can see cow hides. The queen holds her scepter, symbol of her power, before her. The west wall depicts the seven sacred cows and the bull of the west in two registers. They are all different in color and pattern, and all are named. They're the gods of fate. They each have a table of fodder in front of them, and they will provide the queen bread, beer, and all that is useful for the soul. The horns of the bull differ from the lyre-shaped horns of the cows. Below them are oars, which help guide Nefertari on her way. Actual oars were found in Tutankhamun's tomb. The voyage to the land of the dead was envisioned as a journey by boat across the cosmic seas. Nefertari must now descend a second stairway into the actual burial chamber, which almost concludes the journey of death and resurrection. The body rested in a sarcophagus here, now gone. All the grave goods are also long gone. The chamber is large. It has four square pillars for support. Annexes are on either side. As you enter, the pillars depict dual priests wearing the leopard skin that identifies them as priests. Other sides of the pillar show Nefertari with the goddesses and bear images of Osiris. The wall on the left, as you enter, depicts the beginning of Nefertari's journey through several gates to the underworld. Not all are shown. These are each guarded by fierce, almost demonic beings. She holds her arms upward in a gesture of adoration before the gold and red doorway and speaks their names in order to be allowed to pass. Hieroglyphic texts here provide these names and titles that are so necessary. These are her tests on the journey to the underworld and resurrection. The guardians are quite vividly named, such as he who eats the excrement of his hind parts, or he who eats snakes, and so forth. There is a niche for the canopic jars, which contained the mummy's viscera in a chest protected by the goddess Newt. On the eastern walls, the queen must pass by caverns, not all shown, to the land of Osiris. Each underworld cavern is guarded by a large squatting being armed with a knife. Crocodile, bull, and serpent heads adorn them. Nefertari must get past each frightening beast. Nefertari emerges, completing her journey, reaching her destination in the underworld. The center, where her sarcophagus would be, is her place of resurrection. 
It's surrounded by the four columns that depict gods and priests, including a touching, delicate rendering of Hathor holding the Ankh, or breath of life, to Nefertari's nostrils. On the wall, which is considered to be at the ritual western point, Nefertari stands regally, adoring with arms upheld before three gods of the underworld. Osiris, Hathor, and Anubis are shown seated on low thrones, cleverly overlapping while holding symbols, the crook and the flail, an ankh, and on Hathor's head, the symbol for the west. In front of Nefertari are the four canopic jars that hold her organs, which will complete her body. She has arrived at her own resurrection. Thus is affirmed the place of Nefertari in the sacred land, along with eternal life. At this point, Nefertari is one with the sun god Re. She's allowed to go forth and rise again like the sun depicted below the soffit at the entrance. The journey was a dangerous one, but she was successful. Essentially, the tomb here is an exquisitely illustrated manifestation of the Book of the Dead, also called the Book of Going Forth by Day. So here you have it, one of the most elaborate, beautifully painted tombs in all of Egypt. It illustrates the religious beliefs of the Egyptians at that time, much like the Sistine Chapel represents images from the Bible and creation. In the Egyptians' case, the profound anxiety that they must have felt in the face of death was allayed by this enormous artistic endeavor which allowed them to contemplate a beautiful afterlife. It's an extraordinary testament to their power of belief and to their absolutely unparalleled imagination and artistry. This is a masterpiece on more than one level. And now we say goodbye to the land of the dead and the land of the pharaohs. We will embark on our sea journey to Greece, where something entirely new awaits us a new approach to the human body and human philosophy, yet it owed a debt to the Egyptians, as you will see.